Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of The Best Games, period. I'm Jack Gardner. With me today are my co-hosts, Jeremy Brown and Daniel Jones. And today we're going to be talking about a very special game from 2001. That's right. We're going to be talking about Ico. Devil May Cry. What? No? No, 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 no. And I'm going to call it Ico, even though I know the technical way to say it is Ico. But I'll leave that up to the academics in Washington. (laughs) It's Ico. Just so you know. I'm still going to say it Ico, because I I can't help myself. When Fumio Ueda says it in Japanese, you can hear him say Ico. Well, why don't you just speak Japanese if you love that so much? Yeah. Domo arigato. Mr. Roboto. <laughs> Most likely I'm going to end up saying both several times throughout this episode, so... <laughs> At some point we should actually do a Double May Cry episode, though, also, by the way. Okay. Side note. I'm down for that. Because I love that game. Okay. Okay. I did not, and that will make it a good oh, episode. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Much like this episode, I think. Uh, this may be our our most uh, uh, debated episode yet. And I'm honestly very surprised because we were we usually don't talk a whole lot before we start recording, but uh, you guys both told me you weren't huge fans of uh, Ico of revisiting this game. Well, don't put words in my mouth. Uh, yeah, those are the words you know. that came out of your mouth. I just stated, I, all I stated was I may not, at the end of the day, agree with your opinions, and I said that because I thought I might not be able to be here tonight, but I'm here, so. Well, you know what? You're supposed to agree with all my opinions, Jeremy, so. Hmm. They're obviously the better ones. I mean, So on. what <laughs> are our opinions on Eco? Jack, what's yours? Ah, uh, fine. I'll go first. Yeah, just go first. Uh... I think it's an incredibly important piece of video game history. I think Certainly. it has influenced many games in the almost 15 years since. I think it's probably one of the greatest games to come out on PlayStation 2. And it came out, like, how, how's this for a mind blow in your mind? I, I almost said mind blow, and that... <laughs> I feel like that might have different connotations, Uh, but it it came out two years after Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. Like, compare the polygons of Ocarina of Time to what we see in Ico, and it's insane. You have bloom lighting in Ico. You have freaking shadows that aren't circles on the ground uh like you have these fantastical environments you have storytelling that is done through cutscenes or without cutscenes also a nice little touch is it had um the the legs of the characters actually bent realistically when they were going up and down stairs oh yeah I'm serious. Yeah, that's, that was an innovation that that eco. I, I can't remember the name of the term, but yeah, <laughs> it was one of the first games to have that. That's actually pretty cool. Although contracted I, articulation, I think, is what it's called. I will say that when they are running, when Ico especially is running around, his legs look super weird. Nobody runs like that. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I I cut the game some slack because those animations. Are, are really are, nice. Are, are we really starting out comparing this game to Ocarina of Time? I mean, really? No, I, I, yeah, I feel like we shouldn't really. Are, really? Because I, I feel like I, they're, they're, the art styles are completely different. For I don't know. I mean, I I'm, think, I'm, everything. I'm not, I'm not the talking about the, art, the game. I'm not talking the about the art style. style, though. I'm talking about the, the technology in general and the technology. It's just okay. Like, carry on. <laughs> it, it's it's a two year difference, but they. Three, actually. Is it a three Ocarina came out in 98, yeah. Okay. But still, it's not that big of a difference because the game like started development in 97 or something like that. Yeah, for It was PS1. intended to be a... I mean, it started development for a late PlayStation 1 game, as, as I recall. Right. Yep. And ended up being an early PS2 game, yes. Yeah, so 
it took a little bit longer, but I think I don't know. I I find everything about Ico to be incredibly Im- impressive. And uh I think it is a fair comparison to make between The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and Ico. I think they're both adventure games set in, you know, large, expansive worlds that you explore. You have to solve puzzles. I think that this is essentially Fumito Ueda's Legend of Zelda. Like, this is, this is his version of that. Jack, did you Story. play this game in 2001 when it came out? I played it a couple years after it came out. So but, I think so on 2004. Two, yeah. Okay. And then one of my friends stole it and never gave it back, and I think he sold it. Is your friend my yeah. uncle? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jeremy, you don't really like Ika? So I've 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 started this game several times. The furthest I've ever made it was probably about six hours into it. Yep. Uh, Same here. I like the story. Like I actually like the story a lot. Um I never played it for the first time until probably two thousand ten, two thousand eleven ish. And the things that people raved about it regarding the bloom lighting and the graphics and all that just weren't there at that point, and they're still not there, in my opinion, at that point. Most recently, I played it on PlayStation Now. I rented it, put about four hours into it, and the cutscenes are amazing. They're beautiful. But the actual game itself, it just, in my opinion, does not hold up. Uh, maybe if I play it on, like, a standard definition TV or... A smaller TV, it might be better, but it's really just ugly. It is. Oh my goodness. Oh hmm. my goodness. Oh, well, my I don't goodness. think. <laughs> Hold on. I... Can we start with that? I'm I'm just gonna lay into that because I actually disagree. I mean, I think it's a gorgeous game. I think it's it's beautiful. Um, I I did happen to play it for the first time in 2001 when when it first came out. Um, I have distinct memories of renting that game and Devil May Cry at the same time. Um, I ended up buying Devil May Cry um, pretty much as soon as I returned it to Blockbuster because I just loved it so much. Um, <laughs> and and then I, I did play Eco more later. I purchased it and finished. Um, not finished. I, I played probably around six to eight hours. And just... I think it's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful game. I, that is one thing that I I wouldn't say. I think it, that art style um, is this odd mix of realism and fantasy. Um, and there are times when you're looking at it and it looks photorealistic, like the grass and the water and the the like the way the birds move, even though they're not like super real looking, but they they just look. Like they fit so well in in the environment. Oh man, the, that that game's fantastic looking. Fantastic. I, you're crazy. <laughs> crazy. Uh, I am crazy, but I disagree. I don't think it holds up well. That's part of at the end of the show. I'm gonna say I wouldn't recommend it. But whatever. I mean, I don't. I don't either. But but the graphics. Psh. I think the graphics at the time, if I had played it in 2001, like y'all, I might be completely in agreement. But I didn't. You know, and this is the best games period, and we're talking about games that we've played now and whether they hold up. And in that area, I just don't think it does. I think you're right that from a technical perspective, the graphics are inferior to what have clearly inferior to what has come since. But I think that the aesthetic itself is incredibly solid. I think I would compare it to, say, like like God of War. When I played that game first on PlayStation 2, I loved it. When I played the remastered version on PlayStation 3, I thought the graphics were horrible. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's a, a, a baseline for people to understand where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. I agree with you on God of War, but I just disagree on, on Eco. You can be like, wrong. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think... It's it's the aesthetic choices of Ico are just so solid that when you go back and look at it, 
You're going to be saying eco by the end of the show. Dan Can we just start not. calling it ICO? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say every time I Googled eco, Google wanted to change it to ICP? No, I'm not Googling insane clown posse. <laughs> Why would you? Who wants that? Nobody ever wanted that. <laughs> Apparently somebody. <laughs> Yeah. So let's talk about the things we don't like, and then we can get into the things we do like. How about that? All right. So, but I first. I am for the record saying that I think that Ico's aesthetic choices hold up the same way Wind Waker's aesthetic choices hold up it, when you go back and look at the original product today. Really? Yeah. I I think in different ways. I think, do you yeah. do you just hate Zelda games, Jack? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Zelda games, but I hmm. I think you can go back today and look at you know Wind Waker on the original GameCube, not the HD re-release, and I think you can be like, wow, this is a really pretty game, and that's the same mm-hmm. feeling. Like I booted up Ico right before this podcast just to kind of refresh myself a little bit, yeah, and uh, I was I was pretty engrossed in it to the point where I almost forgot that we were podcasting in just a handful of minutes and i was just running around looking at torches and like the whole structures and maybe that's kind of it i i I just really appreciate the architecture of the environments it's really pretty see to me those things i could hardly see and again maybe it's my tv maybe it's because i don't know maybe maybe i should have played it on an old standard T- definition TV and it might have been more impressive but those things just looked terrible wow then maybe we just value different things in like aesthetic choices like the things in the distance when you looked out at the at the at the overall scape it was gorgeous it was beautiful yeah but up close not so much no, the saying. grass the water the did you, <laughs> the, you you obviously got to the windmill part yeah. I mean, come on. Oh, there was a windmill, Jeremy. A windmill. <laughs> Dan, Jeremy, everything. you're supposed to be on my side teaming up against Jack. What's going on here? No, here's what I want to say, though. <laughs> I went back and I played a, a few, uh, like, an hour or so just before the podcast as well. And I've been watching videos and stuff. And that game is just brilliant looking. But then the moment you actually start to play and stop just staring at the beautiful environments and the art and the architecture, it, that's where it all falls apart for me, is, yeah. is the gameplay. The, the art, I will not begrudge how pretty that game is to look at. I'm not begrudging the art. I'm, I'm begrudging the, the graphic fidelity that people raved and ranted about in 2001 it's not the same now it's it's just not oh well definitely not no i i well no but that doesn't mean it, and that it, seems it's obvious yes nice to look at yeah but outside of that oh there's so many little nagging things about that game that just don't really work for me and never have okay can I get into them? Yeah, I'll please go do. Into. Go for it. I'm, right. I'm eager to hear how so wrong you are. So, for example, when I go to, to play tonight, just the first hour, right, I go to save. And I do appreciate that there's a couch pretty much after every puzzle or encounter with the black shadow beasts. Um, but you, I went to a couch, and I don't remember, but I remember this happening to me constantly when I played it. Any time I've played it in the past, and I've I've played in in starts and fits here and there, um, and I go to sit on the couch, and Yorda comes over to the couch, and she walks over, and it takes her about thirty seconds to walk over to the couch, and then she walks there, and I'm just sitting on the couch, just chilling, waiting, and. I- Seriously waited for about a minute, and she still hadn't sat down. Right? So I I I had to get up. I had to get up off the couch, and sit back down, and then finally she sat, and we could save. And that kind of thing happens all the time, and 
I, I was walking downstairs, and I went through a doorway, and got to the other side of the doorway, and she was not there. Yeah. And I don't know why I couldn't just have her following me. I had to be holding her hand and dragging her behind me the entire time. And it's little things like that. Like, I know that one of the reasons they changed this game from PS1 to PS2 is because of the AI. Sometimes when I think about that game and how and playing it, I think maybe they should have waited a couple more years because <laughs> the AI just still wasn't quite there yet. Yeah. And that that's my biggest problem is babysitting her, and it makes me not like her as much. That's probably my biggest problem, too. I just kind of wanted to touch on the graphics part first. Yeah. Do you have anything to add on that, Jeremy? Well, yeah, just, yeah I mean, it is kind of annoying and uh you know i i don't really like like uh escort quests in games in general yet i love the last of us which is entirely an escort quest so i get how that sounds crazy and hypocritical but it's it's confusing it's not fluid and even when you grab her arm and run with her like all of a sudden the controls get all wonky and you can fall off a bridge and not even realize it <laughs> Just yep. because it's not the same. And if you run a little ways away and then call for her, it takes a good 30 seconds to realize if she's coming or not. So you run back for her and then you realize she probably is coming. But maybe <laughs> she's not. You know, the game feels very imprecise to me when it comes to... And Jack, you mentioned like combat you felt was intentional. But yeah. all the controls feel just so not right. Like really loose. I will I will give you that the AI is sometimes frustrating, but I I do think that well, the same way we kind of cut slack to older games because of the technology not quite being there. Mm -hmm. I think I think Ico deserves a little bit of slack for being one of the first games to implement a fully AI'd character, you know. So like it is kind of sloppy. But at the same time, that laid the groundwork for a lot of other great AI companions in the future, you know? Sure. This is like one of the first games where your companions weren't just following in a line behind you in a 16-bit landscape. You know, you, they had to figure out how to program an AI to navigate around complex obstacles. I think that achievement, because when Ico works the way it's intended to work, I do think it is a very fluid game. However, like you guys have pointed out, there are a lot of times where it doesn't work as it's intended, and you right. uh, get frustrated. Well, there's times you try to jump up and grab a ledge, even though there's a little mark on the floor that shows you where you need to jump, or a chain, and you can like do that like for like three or four times in the exact same spot, and it doesn't work, mm -hmm. and then you do it again, and then suddenly it does work. That's that's frustrating. Yeah. 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 There. It's very. Uh, go ahead. Oh. Well, there are those really imprecise things, but I would also argue that it's one of... The same way that The Legend of Zelda... I'm going to be making a lot of Zelda comparisons, but the same way The Legend of Zelda has a lot of contextual actions, this also has a lot of contextual actions, but it has the addition of a jump button. And I think that changes a lot of things, especially when the game was originally designed for PlayStation 1 and makes the leap to PlayStation 2, I think that had this been a PlayStation 1 game, it would have been much sloppier. I don't know, uh, man. If this game had a Z button or a lock-on button, game changer, totally. <laughs> Just saying. Do you, are you serious? Yeah. Yeah, I could see... I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Like, any improvements to the combat would be welcome. Well, not just combat, but the, the traversing, everything. Like, you know, like, you can see where you need to go. You can figure out the puzzles, which are fun. I like the puzzles. I like, mm -hmm. I actually don't even mind the backtracking. I like running around and finding all the things you got to do and then and the backtracking to do it. It's the in, imprecision that, that got to me at times. Um, I think, to me, it's not even, like, it's not the in, in, uh, Imprecision. <laughs> That's a hard word to say. I don't it's think not I said it right either, but you know, <laughs> it's is that even a word or is it like Im imprecise?ness The 
I don't know. The mm. That's why I said Z button. I was just hoping to get away with that. <laughs> so, to, to me, Eco is a good analog to classic Prince of Persia games. Oh, mm-hmm. thank Bef- you. I want to talk about Prince of Persia compared to this game. Well, not Sands of Time. like, But yeah, I, I, I am going to bring that up because it reminds me, the movement reminds me of the f- very first Prince of Persia game. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on Mac? Com- Commodore? Mac, maybe? I remember playing right. it on Mac, but that might not have yeah. been the first system it came out on. And that game is has very deliberate movement, and Eco moves kind of the same. Like, you can't jump really easily. You're not Mario um, or Donkey Kong. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you have to take the, the animations into account when you jump. Right, you do. And that makes... Uh, it just makes certain things kind of difficult. Certain yeah. jumps. Um, and especially the camera doesn't always help with that. Sometimes the camera is positioned awkwardly yep. for p- parts where you're, you're like walking on a thin platform or you have to make a a very far leap. Um, and meanwhile, in 2002, I want to say, Prince of Persia Sands of Time came out. And like like Jeremy, I think, was going to say, like that, that game did a lot of the same things Eco did. And to me, at, in a lot of ways, did them... So so much better. The movement was more fluid, um, and it... Came out in 2003. Oh, 2003? All right. So I think it was... I think it was inspired a lot by Eco, so it's kind of an unfair comparison. Mm -hmm. But, like, just... that That's a game that that does platforming in 3D incredibly well, and it's just... I've gone back and played that game recently and i i still love it but again i have problems with that game i hate the combat in that but anyway we're not talking about that <laughs> game um but i don't know just the the way that eco moves annoys me and i'm not a fan of his deliberate movements okay yeah i can i can kind of see that but <laughs> you're bringing up all these points and i don't necessarily disagree with all of them <laughs> But I yes, we got him on the ropes, Jeremy. But I don't think that's the main takeaway from Ico. Like I think I think that there are so many important things that it did and that it does really really well. Like we haven't even talked about the fact that there's there's nothing on the screen. It's just the game on the screen. There's no health bar, there's no stamina, there's yeah. no there's no ammo, there's no little menu or anything like mm-hmm. that. There's no button prompts. It's just the game. You, you, and... can't, you can't die from being defeated yourself. The only way to die is if you were to get sucked into that black hole. Or if you fall off a cliff or something. Well, that too. Where it's like painfully obvious <clears throat> that you are, you're dead. Yes. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I was watching, in, to prepare for this, I watched some of the special features on the PlayStation 3 version yeah. Um, and that was something that very few people had done before, just a completely clean user interface. And they, apparently they struggled a lot with that. There was a lot of pushback to make it more traditional, to have a health bar, to have different game over screens. And they, they, Ueda really fought for this clean UI. And I think that ultimately that is something that really, that really a benefits the game and B really kind of sent a shockwave throughout the industry. Like there are a lot of games now that do that. uh, But I think, I think Ico is probably something to everyone can point to and be like, that's, that's the, the reason we did that. Like that's, that's the big inspiration here. I can't disagree with that. I think it's revolutionary and great in so many levels. I don't, again, I don't hate the game. I'm just thinking of it from a perspective. If I was 
a new gamer and had to go back and decide if I wanted to play this game to really complete my repertoire, I don't know that it, that it would be one of the ones. Complete your reptar? My reptar. <laughs> repertoire. Man, none of us can say words right now. No, uh, <laughs> no I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm with you because, and, and I'm surprised that I feel that way because I like so many games that are inspired by Eco. Um, like I said, Prince of Persia, Journey, Brothers, Tale of Two Sons, like so many Uncharted games. Uncharted 3. <laughs> Almost any critically sure. acclaimed game of the last decade can trace <clears throat> itself back to Ico. E- like, e- Ico. That's crazy, right? I mean, yeah. I, like, I think... I think that right. at some point, if you're going to sit down and say, like, I am a well-rounded gamer, I think Ico is something that everyone should play to be able to say that, you know? Sure. Like, I, I wouldn't, you I can... don't think I'd necessarily sit my nephews down in front of Ico and be like, play this until you can no longer play anything else or, like, until your thumbs fall off. I, I don't know. I'm just saying words at this point. But you get the, you get the point. Like I, I, it's not it's not kids' first video game material. It, but I also don't. And I even though there's a lot of hand holding in it, it doesn't hold your hand. No, yeah, that's ironic. Yeah, even not kids. If if an adult has never played Eco and they consider themselves a connoisseur of video games and they want to complete their knowledge. Um, and they want to play it just out of curiosity, I go for it. All, more power to you, but don't expect to have a great time. Oh my goodness. No. Expect <laughs> lots of expect <clears throat> lots of frustration. Expect there some of the greatest puzzles before Portal. Like, this is one of the great puzzling games. I would say before Prince of Persia. Like like was Prince, Prince of Persia, Persia, was Prince of Persia Sand of Time like a puzzle heavy game? Oh yeah. yeah. Tur- second time. half had a lot okay. of puzzles, yeah. Really great puzzles. Great puzzles. Um, oh, Ma- man. And maybe yeah. that's what I was expecting since I'd played many Prince of Persia games before I'd played this game, because it looked very similar to me. I like just, you know, the whole landscape mm-hmm. aesthetic visual thing. I'm like, yeah, and you know, the the you know, Eco and, and Yorda, I'm thinking Prince and Princess, but it just didn't work out that way, so maybe that's why I'm disappointed in it to a degree. I don't know. And the combat... Uh, the combat. Yeah. That's... Can, yeah, let's talk about the can combat. Can we dig into that? Yeah. Because here's my, my stance on the combat, and that is it is intentionally sloppy because it's supposed to be a young boy trying to fight off shadow monsters. And so, for most of the game, you're swinging a stick of wood, and then eventually you get a sword. But at the end of the day, you're still some weird... How old do you think he's supposed to be? Like, 12? 13? I was gonna say... 10. I was gonna say 11. So yeah, in that range. Yeah. yeah. Pre-teen. I mean, of course yeah. I'm gonna say 11, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's probably 11 or 12, yeah. Okay. Like, I mean, it's... Can it's, I ask real quick, Jack, because yeah. you know more about this game than, I think, maybe Daniel? Maybe. And certainly more than I. Why are the people that ba- that are taking him to sacrifice him, why are their horns turned sideways, yet they have horns, but they're banishing this kid because he has horns, or sacrificing him? So I'm I'm pretty sure, like, again, it never outright explains a lot of this stuff but yeah i think it's heavily implied that the horns that they're wearing are helmets and that yeah like you can see in the statues around in the environment that there are a lot of horned statues and like it seems to be like some sort of religious significance sure and well, and Ico's horns are like actually a part of his body so we're going to go into spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> as we always do. I think we've already established that's just a thing we do here on the Best Games Parade. <laughs> yep. But just in but case for some to... reason you decided to listen to the fourth episode first. Yeah, exactly. Here you go. Um, so also, like, with the horns, 
the shadow figures are it, it, you can see if you look closely at them and later they have horns um, and they are it's heavily implied that they are the other kids that have been locked up and right. sacrificed. Yes. Um, so that's part of the story and the significance of, of the horns. I, I don't know. Yeah, like I think the, the, the nearby town or society or whatever, they have this thing where it, if a kid is born with horns and, you know, he's taken over to this island and marooned inside like one of these stone eggs to I guess right. just be left to die. Yeah. But Iko is lucky enough that is do we know his name is Iko even? Or is that just the name of the game? I think that's No, it's Iko. It's Iko. But, <laughs> but I think his name is Iko. I think that's okay. a given, yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah. and so Iko's lucky enough that when his captors leave uh, his egg falls over and breaks open, and then he ends up finding the Yorda, who is the daughter of this shadow queen yes. that controls the shadows and lives on this island. And she wants to take over her body to live forever, which is, you know, the main reason I had a kid, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, I can kind of relate to that. Yeah. It's but, a... but why, when they drop him off, there's all these, you know, really in, intact uh, pods kind of fall out for us really when they put them at the beginning in the pods spoilers yeah and his happens to be the one that's all cracked and you know susceptible above it i think yet yet they put him in that one i think i got the impression that that might have been like the last open one or something like all the other ones had been filled because it was the only one that was already open although I don't know, magic, man. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, I do think it's interesting to talk about this story, though, because the story, I think, is one of the best things about Ico, and there's hardly any dialogue in the entire game. The story is fantastic. I will agree. Yeah. The, and I think that's one of the things I really like about Ico, and another reason I think it really stands the test of time is because we... It's one of the first games to just be like, we're telling a story almost entirely through gameplay. And that story isn't, uh, you know, kid fights shadow monsters, saves princess. Like, right. it's, it's an emotional journey of, you know, two people helping each other get out of a situation. Because Aiko can't go anywhere without Yorda, and Yorda can't go anywhere without Aiko. <clears throat> and... It's like one of those great Disney buddy movies. Uh, for some reason right now, all I can think of is Milo and Otis. Uh, oh, I'm trying movie. to... And that's because I heard recently some terrible, terrible facts about that movie that will ruin it forever. Oh, I read those <laughs> a few years ago, yeah. But still. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't look it up if you want to enjoy that movie. No, please don't. <laughs> but... You know, it's two two people overcoming these insurmountable odds to try and find some sort of life at the end of it. And I think that you can make a really solid argument that this is one of the first games to, you know, ask the seriously ask the question, can can a computer make a man cry? Uh, and the answer is yes. A lot of people cried. This was their first game that made them cry. It's not a happy game. <laughs> no, it's not. No. Like I said, my gripes are pretty much the gameplay and, you know, I guess that's it. I don't know. To your aesthetic um, gripes, Jeremy, I Gra- I have to say grapes? just... Uh, <laughs> to my aesthetic <laughs> gripes? Like the little, Aesthetics, the little aesthetic plastic grapes. ones? Yes. Grapes. Yep. Yep. Mm, grapes. Um... Even Coley saw me playing it, and I, granted, it was the HD version, which does look better. Um, but she does it? watched me play it. I'm not sure of that. Yeah, oh my god, yes, it does. <laughs> but she looked at it, and she was like, wow, this game looks fantastic. I was like, yeah, and this came out in 2001. She's like, what? 
She was shocked that it came out in 2001. She couldn't believe it. She thought it came out, like, a couple of years ago. Like, that's how good that game still looks. I, I guess we have to disagree. Okay. Well, I just I just provided scientific proof <laughs> that Col- the lay person thinks it proof? looks beautiful. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, I watched many videos myself, some covered in mahogany, and <laughs> m- most of them said that it's better off playing this game in standard definition the way it was intended, and it looks much better. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, there are always going to be some purists. So, story. We, we kind of got into story, but we never finished it. So, Eco is, yes, banished and he's sacrificed from his village because mm-hmm. he has horns and that's a bad omen. Yep. And for whatever reason, there's a bit of a shakeup. yet only his pod falls and he opens up. He climbs to the top of this big old tower and he finds this girl in a cage, which is Yorda, who happens to be this dark shadow queen's daughter. Mm-hmm. He gets her down, he rescues her, and they have to find their way out of this temple type of thing and back to somewhere and eventually the queen confronts him she wants to use yorda's body to make herself live longer because she's getting old and basically make herself immortal or something yeah Yeah. right and so eventually yorda turns to stone things happen then what happens jack basically it ends with yorda dying and aiko escaping the island the end and it's sad. It's sad. Yeah, it is sad. Well, there is an alternate ending after the credits. That is also true. Yes. <laughs> so in the alternate ending, which I think just happens after the credits, or do you need to like fulfill certain criteria before you get this? I'm not sure. Do you guys know what criteria is there to fulfill? Yeah, I think I think it just happens yeah. after the credits. Yeah, I think it's just after the credits. If you stick around, you see that Eco has washed up on a shore um, in his boat. And he he gets gets out, and he sees something down the beach, and you, you walk towards it. And it turns out to be Yorda, and she is on the beach, um, lay, laying there, and you... Eco walks up to her and she opens her eyes. Mm-hmm. She's she's alive and they are free of the castle. So it does end on a on an up, up note. Yeah, I mean, it it does end on that up note. But what most people take away from it is the the end where like Eiko's mm. horns are broken and yeah. Yorda just kind of like, kind of like a ghost Yorda, sort of. Yeah. Uh, picks him up and carries him to a boat, and then yeah. s- sends him out in the boat. Yeah, she's a dark, shadowy figure. Yeah, and uh, yeah, she's kind of creepy. Gorda. <laughs> and that, I don't know that moment because of all the frustration of having to constantly take care of her because of all of the effort you went through to try and get her out she her the the gesture of her picking you up and carrying you to safety is just for sure it it's really powerful it's a really powerful yeah. moment and that's something that isn't achieved through cutscenes and it's not something that's achieved that that could have been achieved with cutscenes. It's something that grows organically uh, because the player has had to put up with Yorda for the entire game. <laughs> like I'm gonna I'm gonna argue I'm not arguing that it is intentional that her AI sometimes is stuttery and not great, but I am gonna argue that ultimately, even though there's a lot of frustration involved in that relationship, even though there's a lot of struggling and a lot of maybe not entirely kind feelings and maybe some harsh words are shouted. Uh, (laughs) I'm going to argue that ultimately that pays off in a beautiful moment. And that beautiful moment is worth all of that time and effort and... (laughs) 
What? I just disagree. I just disagree that all of that is not is worth it. I Did don't, you make it that I don't far? Think it's Did worth you make it, it. that no, far? I didn't. No, I didn't. There you you go. know why? Because I distinctly re- remember the first time I played this game, getting to a part where the freaking dark beasts just kept coming, and there were flying ones, and they just kept grabbing her and taking her away, and I got so sick of it, and I, I, I distinctly remember saying to the TV, <laughs> fine, take her. I don't like her anyway. And put it down, and I didn't touch that game for another, like, five or six years. <laughs> because I just said, fuck it. <laughs> well, you know, you know what modern gaming would say to that, Daniel? What? Get good, son. Get good. Also, yeah. for Kino's you know- score, Daniel now has two F-bombs to buy one, so, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's the other thing. It's it's interesting that you cite that as an experience because, like another game that has already been featured on this podcast, Dark Souls, took a ton of inf- inspiration from Ico. A ton yeah, of it. It did. Yes. Like even just comparing them side by side visually, you can see a lot of the same yeah. surreal architecture and mm-hmm. angles and. And Miyazaki has said that. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. the way that they zoom in from the, the you know, the, yeah, I'm just going to shut up now because you know what I mean. <laughs> but yeah. The sometimes wonky so camera many, angle, yeah, it makes exactly. sense. Exactly. So many games have taken inspiration from this. I'm not ever going to call it a bad game or a terrible game or a not important game, ever. Right. There's also a minecart level, for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> that is that's true. It's not nearly as frustrating as the Donkey Kong minecart level though. No. But also not as fun. Um all right, but I I don't know. Um I don't I don't think you're you're completely wrong, Jack, because I do think that what Eco did to for video game storytelling is incredibly important because it, it basically said in an era where every game just thought that cutscenes was the only way to to tell a story or you know a couple games were finally figuring out what Valve had figured out in 1998 with Half-Life but for the most part storytelling was a passive thing but with Eco they built up this connection between the player and this other character through the gameplay and and you know the physical nature of you actually holding the R1 button to hold her hand that's really important that you have to hold that button to hold her hand and and you have that connection mm-hmm. you know um and that's tangible and you the game fosters that and builds that throughout the game um, and throughout the adventure, so that by the end you do care. You are supposed to care about her. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I never got there, so I don't know for sure. So, but you know, a lot of people that did get there feel the same way you did, Jack. So um, maybe you just have to get through the frustration. But to me, I, it it wasn't worth it. It. I I will give you that it is sometimes really frustrating. It is a frustrating experience sometimes. It's not it's not quite like Portal where the game is just the right amount of frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, it's, when was Portal cause... ever frustrating? Portal was awesome the entire time. <laughs> well, I, I mean, sometimes some of the puzzles can be kind of frustrating, and there are some platforming segments that are kind of frustrating. Yeah, platforming segments. But I think for the most part, Portal was frustrating only because of your own limits, yeah. right. your own limitations. Yeah, yeah, big difference. Right. Yeah. I will say that this game came out around the time where people thought of action-adventure games as being things like Spyro the Dragon, uh, mm-hmm. Crash Bandicoot, Ape Escape. Yeah. Like, the, that's... that's those are its contemporaries. Like Re- that's revolutionary is not an unfair title, similar to what we put on Dark Souls. I mean, uh, it's it, it was very different for its time. Without even playing it at the time, I can see that. 
I mean, I would argue that even today it's very different from a lot of the games we have. Like, the influence, you can see the influence throughout tons of different games, but if you go back and actually play it, it still feels different. It doesn't feel quite like anything you've played before. I did go back and actually play it, and it still kind of was not that fun, but yes. And I, I, like, I kind of agree with you. It's not a fun... It's not fun in the same way other games are fun. But if I had sure. if I had been an avid gamer in 2001 when this game game came out, I probably would have totally loved it. Yeah, I that's mean, right. I, this game kind of came out during your dark your gaming yeah, dark ages. I get that and I acknowledge it. I mean, it was different. It was unique and it made you hit like Daniel said, it didn't really hold your hand even though you had to hold somebody's hand the entire time. Mm-hmm. Um I I like that about it. I just can't say for sure that I think that it's something you have to play to be considered a, you know, true gamer oh, in this day and age. Okay. I, I want I, I think we should stay away from being a true gamer because there are so many different kinds of gamers these days, but yes, but you know what I, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will, I will also attempt to make this argument that at the time that, Ico was being developed and was released. Uh, Sony did not have many good first party titles. A lot of its games were coming from third parties, like Capcom. Yeah. And I would argue that Ico is the game that made everyone go, oh, Sony, Sony can make games. You know what I find interesting during this conversation is we're all jacked up Indian Mojo show <laughs> for <laughs> The Last Guardian, right? Oh, yeah. Which would not yeah. be possible without this game. No. So, I mean, there is that. Absolutely. And if you look at the special features on the PlayStation 3 version of Which Ico, are great, they, by the way. they are amazing. Like, they made, like, a almost an hour-long mini-documentary about yeah. both games, uh, both Ico and Shadow of the Colossus. If you watch each of the people that they interview, and they're talking about Fumito Ueda, I'm probably butchering his name, and I really apologize if you ever listen to this. I'm so sorry. They, it's, It seems to me like they genuinely think that he is a genius. And I think if you play his games... I think you can see it. Like, I'm pretty convinced he is a genius. Well, the other interesting thing about the game is that he was so so heavily involved with almost every aspect of it. Mm-hmm. The the art direction, the um, I mean, he even he even designed the cover art. Yeah. Which is terrible cover art, by the way. Just wait, it's, which it's, which it's, cover it's, art? Are you talking about the the cover art where Iko is like front and center, and then there's like Yorda off to the left? No. Or are you talking about the Japanese one where it's like highly stylized and they're like kind of black figures? Yeah. That you one. think that's terrible? It's terrible cover. What art. What is wrong yes. with you? It is. It's surreal. great art, Daniel. I, I disagree. It, it's great art, but it's terrible for the cover of a video game. Well, so what? Who cares? Video a, game art on boxes has been terrible for years. Whatever. I will also Whatever. say that that was the Japanese version, so we have no right to complain about that one. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, but it's the cover on the HD remake, so whatever. Here's here's what I want to know, though, Jack. Why did the combat have to be so terrible? Yes. Just because he's a boy? I mean, because in, in Shadow of the Colossus... That team proved that they could do action really well. In the Shadow of the Classes, it has some of the best boss battles in video game history. Yeah, yeah. And and, and we'll talk about. We'll do an episode on Shadow I of don't the Classes. We're not going to get the into gameplay it. or art or aesthetic or any value of making the gameplays the the combat so terrible. I I just don't understand right. any of that. I I don't either. I uh, I I think that a lot of what the Ico is about is telling story through gameplay. And so when you make a game about a 13 year old kid who's locked in a castle and has to fight off monsters, he's not going to be good at it. 
Yeah, but even, I think even if the monsters the point. he's fighting are the other horned kids that got delegated and relegated and and uh, uh, sacrificed, they're not going to be any good at it either. So why they're, are they so they're, much? They're shadow monsters who've had hundreds of years to practice. In what? Their pod? <laughs> When they, I came are out they of my, in their when pods I, when they're shadow monsters? When I came I out of my so. pod in Fallout 4, I sucked. But you got, they, you got better pretty quickly over the course of, like, 20 in-game days. And Eco does not? Well, he's only in the castle for, like, a day. The game only takes, like, 10 hours to complete. And this, it seems like it's in true. real time. He literally only has one animation for, for hitting them. Yeah. And it's swinging with his... To swinging to from right to left, and that's it. That's all he does. We talked about. And yeah. There could be more animations. Not to mention, could there be? I they, don't. I don't know. Yes. Well, yes, there could have. Not it, not when not when the game was designed in 1997. Oh. Like these, these are groundbreaking animations. <laughs> Can we really ask? Can we really uh, ask that it has the same stuff. amount of animation <laughs> that something that came out four years later, like Shadow of the Colossus, did? No. He could have had a couple more. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you swing at a guy, you should have more than a twenty percent hit chance. Also, they're shadows, so he's literally trying to attack shadows. But why why does he just keep swinging for the legs when clearly you got to swing for the blue eyes? I mean, <laughs> Eco is not stupid. He, I mean, he can figure out these insane puzzles. He should know at some point where to swing, especially after the first few tries. I mean, I'm I'm just I'm just saying it does a good job of conveying that he's an incompetent child that's just trying his best in a cruel dark world that wants to kill him. I'm an incompetent adult that's just trying my best in a cruel dark world that's trying to kill me. I don't get no excuses. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why did why, they could have changed changed it up a little bit. They could have made it a, a little less frustrating. Um, and okay, Jack. Let's get into this then. Ooh. Why can't she pick up a, a stick and defend herself a little bit? Yeah, you mean, know what? What kind of sexism is that? I'm gonna I'm gonna be straight up. If you watch the special features, uh, they come across as uh, the, the team Ico comes oh. across as a little bit sexist and a little bit. Uh, well, for example, they didn't want to do things that were too rough on Yorda because specifically because she's a girl, right? And that just wouldn't be right. And I also think that probably the reason that she doesn't pick up a weapon and fight is, you know, part of it is because of she's a girl. And the other part of it is because that's probably not part of her character. Like that would be a completely different game. Yeah. Mm. Like the, the relationship that they have going on there is that Yorda can open doors, but, you know, see, Ico okay. needs to be able need needs to be the motivation that gets her to the next one. This, this is a weird game to argue about because none of us are really wrong. You're right, Jeremy. Like none of us are actually wrong. It's all just how we perceive yeah. it. But I feel like we should start wrapping up. Yeah, we're pretty close to needing to wrap up anyway. So yeah. Um. So what? Where do we come down on Eco? Is it one of the best games, period? Jeremy, give it to me. Eco is a revolutionary game that is extremely important to not just the PlayStation 2, but gaming in period. But if uh, you really... You don't need to go back and play this game to be... To, to have, you know, any... Yeah, I mean... No, it's not. Wow. All right, definitive. Jack. I am going to use an argument that Jeremy has used before, uh, and that is that when something's the first of something... Damn you, Jack. That makes it that makes it really important. And I think that for the flaws that Ico has, I think that it did so many things right, and it did so many of those things for some of them for the very first time, period in games that I think if you want to consider yourself gaming cultured 
you owe it to yourself to go back and play that game because it is one of the best puzzle games. Like to me, it goes Tetris and then you go all the way to Ico. Then you go to portal. I remember yeah. back in the day, the first time I tried to play this game, it was extremely rare because it was hard to find mm-hmm. on disc. And I paid like 60 bucks for it at GameStop. And I thought Jeez. it sucked, so I traded it back in within seven days before you know I couldn't get my money back. Mm-hmm. Today, you can spend five ninety nine on PlayStation Now and complete the whole game. So, in that regard, yeah, I mean, give it a shot. Why not? But I don't think it's like a definitive game that really makes or breaks you as a person that enjoys video games. I. I just think that, it, especially especially if you're into game design, you need to play Ico, and that because there there's one thing we haven't talked about so far, and that's the minimalist construction of Ico. Yeah, and we touched on we, we, we it. Tu- we touched on it, but uh, basically, this is the game where Ueda invented uh, game design by subtraction. It's called, and basically you start with a whole list of features that you want for your game and then you slowly strip them away until you have the core experience that will make up your full game and n- nothing to distract from that core experience. So you just keep stripping away and stripping away and stripping away. And that's how he ultimately ended up with that, you know, the HUD that has no real user interface. It's just a game. And that is something that is incredibly influential and that's that's why you'll see a lot of game designers today over a decade later pointing to Ico and being like that is one of my main sources of inspiration yeah. i can't cite the exact article or the date or the time but there's a wired article that has just dozens of premier to this date game developers that to look you know quote Ico as being it, a huge inspiration to their games, Naughty Dog being one of them in Uncharted Three. So, I mean, it's important. It's 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 not something you just you know pisha pass off. Right, right. Also, on that note, I'm gonna pull. I'm gonna play my Trump card. Uh, you know uh, who? You know oh who my cited? God, I hate Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> you know who has cited? Ico as one of their main sources of inspiration, one of the things they think is a definitive work of art. His uh, name is Guillermo del Toro, and I believe he's won an Oscar and probably several other awards for being good at art, making art. And are you going to tell me that you're going to disagree with Guillermo del Toro? Well, I mean, the man who brought us things like Pacific Rim and Pan's Labyrinth his silent, and other movies? Pan's Labyrinth. You know, his Silent Hill game did get canceled, Jack. That's true, but that's because Konami sucks. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> exactly. Oh, oh, I I have a theory that, that Sony is going to hook him back up with, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. with Kojima. You know what? Kojima should be out on his island, and he should just be brainstorming. Anybody that said he shouldn't go to his island and yeah, relax. Yeah, no, who, who cr- told them not to go yeah, to a deserted island? Uh, crazy. Where else do you get more what are you talking brilliant about? ideas? Does he actually he, have an island? He said in an interview yes. that he was going to go away to a deserted island for a couple weeks to take a break <laughs> and clear his head. And somebody was like, and no, some, you can't do that. you got to just keep creating. One of his, quote, Hollywood friends... Yeah told him not to do that because he needs to keep his creative juices flowing and not drop out of the game because it will ruin his flow. Okay. They're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, don't know. Like, maybe maybe there's a danger that he'll go to that island and you'll just never come back. So what like, if that makes him Ralph Emerson went Ralph Waldo Emerson went to a pond and just sat and looked at it and came back out with a brilliant work of art. I believe it was a golden like, pond. Yeah. Except yeah. Kojima can't really go and make games on a pond. He can think. In the middle of nowhere. He can write. He can brainstorm. He can... Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Off you, topic. Well, on that note, Ico is his Walden. Bam! Yeah, exactly. Bringing it full circle. Yeah. You know, not everyone needs to read Walden. 
Okay? Man. Not everyone's going to get a lot out of Walden. <laughs> but you know what? Some people who think that they need to know more about philosophy and naturalism, you know what? They should play Walden. And by all of this complex metaphor, play Ico. Maybe Because it's one of the best games, period. Maybe I'm Bam. feeling a little bit frosty, but this episode just became pretty thorough. <laughs> Oh, Jamie. Um, <laughs> Sometimes you hurt me. <laughs> but you love it. So here's... This is a case of gameplay and and the way that games age versus impact. Yeah. And I think Eco's impact can't be understated. It's had a huge impact on, on gaming. And if you want to understand that, you should play it. You don't have to finish it. I think you can get the gist of it just by playing yeah, it. There's a, nothing a wrong hours. with playing it, but you don't have to play it. Right. I mean, but you don't have to play any game. Well, you know what I mean, Jack. We're but, talking about the best game sphere. Like, we talked about Donkey Kong, and should you go back and play it? Yes, I, I absolutely think so. We talked about Dark Souls. Should you go back and play it? Yes, I absolutely think so. We talked about... Uh, the, Walking Dead. The Walking Dead. Should you go back and play it? You, you know... There was some a bit of a division on there. But yeah, I think so. I don't think you have to play Eco. So, in my estimation, is it one of the most influential games ever? Yes. Yes. Is it the is it one of the best games period? No. Oh, I, I how do you how are you dividing that? <laughs> I don't I don't understand. Make me understand. Make me understand there how are... you're reaching that point. There are incredibly influential movies. I can't think of them off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But there are very influential movies like, that I would not recommend anybody going back and watching. Like French New Wave? Yeah, or Cannibal Holocaust. Okay, okay. Although, you know? I, I think that is a horrifically unfair comparison because <laughs> playing through is. Ico I'm is way saying. more enjoyable than sitting through Cannibal Holocaust. <laughs> Plus, it's one of the shorter games that we've talked about so far. Yeah. In terms right. of in terms of gameplay, you can probably finish Ico before you finish before you finish any of the other games that we've talked about. Oh yeah, it's like what, eight hours? Like it's between six to ten hours. Yeah. Like Yeah. I mean play it if you want to. Like if you don't buy an original PS two copy that costs you nine thousand dollars today. Play it. Enjoy it. Why not? Yeah, it. But don't feel like you're an inferior gaming person because you haven't played it. I guess that's well, my right. point. Or because you don't get it. If you don't if you don't think it's that great, then that it's it's not that great to you. Right. Like, I I mean I think yeah. I think I think we're almost think we're all, all saying, saying the same, the same thing. thing. Yeah, except that we are. I don't know that I would recommend if Donkey Kong Country were sixty dollars to play Donkey Kong Country. I don't know that I would pay, you know, a hundred twenty dollars to play Donkey Kong Country. But if you can find well, right. it for five dollars, I would definitely say go for it. The same way where if you can get your hands on Ico for five dollars, if you can rent it off of PSN what you can. for yeah. five dollars, that is totally. There's, I think that. There's almost no excuse for you not to at least try Ico and see where all these great ideas came from. But you should try to run it off PSN on a much smaller TV than I have, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess maybe we're at like an important juncture in our life as a podcast. It seems we've reached we... an impasse. <laughs> <laughs> we... We are still kind of figuring out what our criteria is, yeah. and for me, I really, I really do think that Eco is one of those games that you can admire and you can appreciate it, even if you don't necessarily love it. Yeah, and so, it's like so just for me, it's not the one of the best games. Period. If you want to play one of the best games ever, play their next game, Shadow of the Classes. It's fucking amazing. It's, I keep swearing. It's like Joseph Stalin. But it, it really has is. its place in history. Some good, some bad, but it's important. 
Wow, did you really compare Ico to <laughs> Joseph Stalin? <laughs> Why do we keep doing this tonight? We are off. Uh, no, that we was had mostly so many bad me. analogies. I was, real, I was originally going to go Hitler, but I thought that was too over the top. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. So Ico is not Joseph Stalin or Hitler. It is an amazing... Or like, Cannibal like, Holocaust. You know, it could be a Mussolini. It is, it is an amazing work of art that many people have pointed to as one of the first examples of a serious art, like a work of artistic merit in video games. Yeah. And I think that even just with the historical context of everything that Ico has done and like people should play it. Yeah. But I also think that it is an incredibly moving, beautiful, both emotionally and like, you know, visually, and also the sound. We haven't even uh, mentioned the even sound talk yet. About the soundtrack is great. Yes. There there well, are so many fantastic elements to Ico that I can't not say that it's one of the best games, period. And the fact that you two don't agree with me, it has been blowing my mind. I thought this was just We're not like, really that far apart, though. We just slightly disagree. It's just slightly, but it's just slightly enough, Jeremy. It's just slightly enough. I, I just disagree. I, I think if that game were made today, it would... Ne- it, it, it would... I think it would automatically have some major improvements in the way that things played out but I think if it were made today the... it may not be the same i mean there is that like i'm kind of torn i'm honestly torn yeah yeah i mean there it it's the technological limitations of being made yes. in 2001 <laughs> like yeah that is incredible when this game was being made the the war on terror wasn't a thing yet like mm. it I think it's an artifact of its time, and it shows how far video games have come, but when you go back to it and actually try to play it for enjoyment, it's harder to 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 understand what was so brilliant about it. But, you know, I think that's a problem that people had even at the time that it came out, because... Yeah, 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 yeah it, it didn't sell well. That's why it's so valuable. Like, the disc copy, there were a ton of them. It was yeah, it, highly critically acclaimed, but not commercially. Yeah, it's it's in in the do- <laughs> I keep going back to the documentary cuz I watched it not too long ago, but they talk about the problems they had in pitching the game to people higher up in the studio system because it was really hard to tell like put into words or to even write down what made the game fun because mm. I'm like I'm gonna be honest. Ico isn't necessarily a fun moment to moment experience, nope. but it is a it, it's a journey. Like it is a journey through sometimes good experiences, sometimes bad experiences, and but I think that it is a very worthwhile journey. Yeah, no, I I, I can't disagree with that, Jack. I have one last. Observation. All right. Because I think you're right that I think they had a lot of problems with, like, getting people in Sony to really understand what what was going to work about this game. Um, and I think one of the things that, like, to me, and this is just my speculation, but I feel like the combat was shoehorned in there. And a lot of times you'll you'll come into like a combat scenario right in the middle of a puzzle or right after a puzzle. So it's always designed to be integrated into areas where you have a puzzle, where there's puzzles or platforming um, happening. So you have to it breaks it up and it ruins the flow of the experience. And I would have much rather just played through that game if it was just puzzles and there was no combat okay i actually agree with that i think it would have been a better game without any combat yep you know i can i can see that argument too but at the same time i think i think the combat was necessary to a degree for the story that they're trying to tell 
That was necessary of... because every game in 2001 had to have combat. No, I think it was necessary. Yeah. I think it was necessary because the story they're telling is it has to involve some element of danger. And the environment itself doesn't necessarily You can do that without Crawling, you, you can falling off you can do that and falling off bridges isn't dangerous enough? No, you you can do that without combat, but the the story that they were trying to tell involved a different <clears throat> kind of danger. Yeah. And mm. it was one that falls into a weird category where the combat it, it falls into a weird com- category where the combat isn't necessarily it's not good, the focal point and it's but not it needs the point to be the there. Game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean I... there there needed to be some sort of tangible danger for the player to be afraid of because I remember playing through this game and every time those shadows showed up I would freak out because it was I'd rather disturbing. see some crazy weird ass magic spell that dispelled the shadows as opposed to a flipping stick that couldn't yeah. hit anything though. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean you could argue play... that his horns are magic and then that's why he's able to let dispel him them. Say Sim Salabim, my horns are gonna get him. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> there, there's things that could be I done. I don't know. Alright, we gotta wrap this yeah. up. We there there are things that could be done, but we are not the genu- geniuses that no. Ueda is. No, so. absolutely no, not. True. No. It's a great but game. But this was also I am not his first taking game. away from the game. I'm just saying That's true. You know. He he came from being an animator. Like yeah. Yeah. what a what a huge leap. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, that's Japan for I you. Will, I will close it out just by saying I really hope that the Last Guardian is is half as good as Zico. So that that tells that tells you something. Wait, so you hope it's half as good as Ico, but you wouldn't recommend somebody playing Ico? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It just it makes sense. Just close head. it out. Let's do right, so, this thing. Anyway, you're, you're both crazy. <laughs> thank you. Both crazy. <laughs> thank you for listening to this very contentious episode four of the best games. Period. Jack, Jeremy, thank you for joining me, and thank you out there in listener land. If you like the show, let us know. Share with your friends. Tell everybody about it. We are now on iTunes. You can find us under The Best Games Period on iTunes. Um, we're actually really and, easy to find now. Our yeah. previous podcasts yeah, we were hard that's, to find. Yeah, that was insane. That's, it's super easy to find. Um, subscribe to us. Leave us a review. That would be awesome. We would love to get some reviews up there on our iTunes page. Um, you can also find us on SoundCloud. And on our hosting site, Libsyn. You can also watch the video version of this on YouTube. All of this goes up on Mondays every week. Jack does an awesome job putting all that together. Slow clap for Jack. Jack is amazing. Definitely slow clap. You can follow the show on Twitter, at Best Games Period. And that way you will never miss an episode. So, um, thank you again for joining us. And... We will be back for the next episode where we discuss Star Wars games. And each of us is going to talk about a different Star Wars game that we really enjoy. Because everybody has Star Wars fever right now. And hope you do too. So you come and join us next week. Peace.